Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Fide Master Dennis Montecrucis, and we're going to continue to look at some viewer games. So this is, I think, uh, episode 10, maybe. Anyway, it's um, done quite a few of these, and uh, I hope to get through all the uh, games that are in the list, at least as of this point. Okay, well, we begin where we left off last time, and um, with the game between Spellbreaker and Opponent. Uh, catchy name there. Anyway, Spellbreaker, who submitted it, is about a 20, 2100 player. I think it's 2096 in this game. And his opponent was 2269. And it was a check Benoni that he, he lost with the white pieces. So the check Benoni is this sucker here with E5. So not E6, but E5 kind of locking the game up. So it's kind of a mix between a generic Benoni and a King's Indian. And it can be a tricky variation to handle. Uh, I know back when I was in New York, there was this strong player, at least he was a senior master at the time, and was for many years, uh, Asa Hoffman. And he plays this regularly and has had some good results even against uh, some very strong players. There's a little autobiographical book that he uh, put out a few years ago called Chess Gladiator. And he has a, a chapter there on, on the Czech Benonian presenting some of his successes in, the, in, the, in this opening. And it's, uh, it's a resilient and, uh, you know, very flexible opening variation. It's easy to, to underestimate, too. And I think maybe White was a little bit guilty of that in the game. Okay, so we get to this position. It's not the only way for White to play it, certainly, but it's, it's a way for White to handle this. All right, so Black played this. So far, so normal. And, okay, here White came up with a plan. Well, actually, I, I, I say he came up with a plan, but but I think he kind of fluctuated and maybe got a little bit um, uh, distracted. So he played a3, which has the obvious idea of playing b4. But b4 never happens in the game. So black played g6. This is typical. Black is going for a buildup involving f5, like a king's Indian. White played bishop h6, knight g7. And here I think, okay, this would be a reasonable moment for b4. But... He chose queen d2, perhaps uh, not wishing to allow bishop to g5, swapping off the dark squared bishops. So, okay, that makes sense. Now knight f6. Now here, <coughs> uh, black's idea is to play knight to g8. Though knight to g4 can be played as well. Similar idea. Um, kick the bishop away or swap it off and then go for the break with f5 and bishop to g5 and so on. Uh, here, white played rook a to e1. And I think this is pretty much an irrelevant move. Um, I think, well, you'll see what White's plan was. So played knight g4, takes, takes, h3, kicked it back, knight c1, knight to d7, knight c 3 Now, just to look at this position, you would think that White is much better. I mean, Black has no pieces beyond even the second rank. Um, his dark square bishop, or, well, the dark square bishop isn't protecting the king side that much at the moment. And White's ready to play f4. So here's what happened. a6, f4, bishop f6, king h2, black played h5. And now I think white's position is getting a little bit creaky here. So he played f5. Um, the point is black wants to play h4 here. And after g4, then e takes f4, and all of a sudden black just dominates on the dark square. So he can plant his knight on e5, maybe put the bishop on d4 first, and um, also... Uh, well, okay, that's that's quite enough. I mean, you'll see that there are some real problems. So I tried f5, at, at least keeping the e5 square from black's pieces. Black played h4, g4, bishop to g5, and um, already you can see that white's kingside attack just never got off the ground. White's bishop on g2 is a, a very poor piece, thanks to all the all the pawns on the light squares blocking it. And his queenside play never got going either. And in fact, after queen to e2, black played b5. And after b3, swaps queen a5, rook to b8. And now all of a sudden, black has the better uh, play on both sides. White swapped pawns and then rooks. And in fact, now it got even worse. So knight to b1, knight f6. And this knight's very well placed. The f-file is blocked. Black's bishops are both going to be in the game very quickly. And you can see, I mean, Black is just overrunning the board here. 
and now white is just uh, going to lose material very shortly. I mean, just complete domination here. And here, white resigned. Material still even, but the threat of queen of g1 made is fatal. So a very convincing job of outplaying um, the opponent here by black. Very nice game. Good advertisement for the check Benoni. Now, let's see what white could have done differently. So I think everything up to here is fine. One suggestion I would make is to not bother about the f-pawn or to go for this bishop h6 pin. Uh, I think that ends up often being time-wasting. So there's a game that was played last year, at least last year as of this moment, uh, 2008, by Milov and Atlas, and it went like this. Bishop e3, g6, knight c1, f5, knight to d3. So similar kinds of ideas to what white had in the game with the knight, Riemann over to d3 where it supports both b4 and f4 pawn breaks, but without this bishop h6 jazz, and I think this is uh, entirely to, to White's advantage, uh, not to spend the tempi on that. Okay, so Atlas played knight d to f6, and now White swapped. And this isn't so bad either because, okay, if, if black plays e4, then f4 becomes available for White's pieces, especially a knight. And conversely, on f4, then the e4 square will become a nice uh, hunting ground for, for White's minor pieces. So Milov just got on with uh, queenside play, rook to b1, and leaves it up to black to make some criminal move on the king side. So bishop to d7, b4, b6, takes and takes, rook b7, rook g8, knight b5, f4, and now bishop c5. And, um, okay, it's a sacrifice, but after the capture, I mean, there's d6, there's knight e5, this diagonal comes open. And White has tremendous compensation and went on to win the game. So I think that's uh, something that can be considered. So we can first of all economize on this bishop h6 stuff. Okay, later on, as I said after all of this, I think White should get on with it and play b4. Or after queen d2, knight f6, again play b4. Or maybe play f3 or, or h3. So just keep the knight off of g4 in the first place. Uh, the black can still play knight to g8. All right, so rook a to e8, and we make the moves in the game. And then here I think f4 is just misguided because white can't keep control over the dark squares. So if white could, then I think this could be reasonable. But lacking uh, his dark squared bishop and not being able to keep control with the pawns over the dark squares, I think this is probably a mistake. And it would have been better to play b4, of course, um, as I said, the rook on e1 doesn't really make sense. It should go back to b1. So I think these are all um, little inaccuracies, but the together gave black a very good position. And then later, the last big mistake, I think, after black played b5, white should have just taken and um, at least had a pawn to comfort him in his, uh, in his sufferings. Black certainly has plenty of play, a la the Benko Gambit here. But nevertheless, I mean, at least um, white has something that he can uh, count as an asset. Whereas after b3, then just there's no asset. I mean, white is worse in every possible way. Black has, is going to have two good bishops. Um, his pawn structure is uh, overextended. He has plenty of queenside weaknesses. Black has no weaknesses anywhere on the board. So this is just um, completely in black's favor. Okay, so on to our next game here. So this was played between Kataru and Sosidi. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right. Um, Black was outrated by 300 points in this game, but won nevertheless. And so that was uh, a nice, nice achievement. So white was 1824, black was 1539. And essentially what he wants to know is something about this ending here. We can start from this position. So it's... Black, who is um, on the move here. And black is certainly better. Material is even, but uh, white's queenside pawn structure is obviously very fragile, and black's pieces are more active. Now here, black played rook takes e4, and not only got away with it, but, but won the game. But um, did he need to do that? Well, I'm not sure, but I, I don't think that he can win in any case. So, for instance, something like bishop to g4... 
f3, bishop h3, just trying to loosen up white's uh, structure a little bit. Bishop c2, e6, and all right, let's say bishop to d1, bishop f5. It, it's hard for, for black to break through that last little barrier, so this is just not easy. So, for instance, white can sit with king to e1, bishop to d3, rook e5. And this counter threat of rook to b5 check seems to me to save the day. So, for instance, if king c3, c5, takes, takes here, rook c7, and white is getting enough counterplay. Uh, another possibility here, instead of king to e1, is to just go active right away. But this time, I think, it's not as clear. So, king c3, c5, rook check, takes, takes, king d3. And here the king is getting across. So I think this waiting move with king to e1 is better. And anyway, uh, black can try various ways of, of breaking in, but I, I think, and I, I won't bet my life on this to be sure, but I think that um, white can survive. And likewise on rook to d3 here, okay, I think the exchange is going to be good for for black, because you can play bishop to b1, and then bishop to a2, and then take on b3. But after rook to d3 again, I think rook to e5 is the cure for what um, what ails him. Again, with the threat of rook to b5 check. So, you know, I think there there are various ways in which we can try for this uh, breakthrough without sacrificing, and then maybe sacrifice, or try to find a way to sacrifice later if need be. But um, anyway, black tried the sack right away. And it worked, but I think objectively it shouldn't have. So king takes b3, and now, okay, black has, or sorry, white has um, three moves to choose from. Clearly he's got to move his king somewhere. In the game, he chose the worst possible king move, king to d3, and after bishop to f5 resigned. So he was trying to protect the c pawn, of course, and that just loses. Uh, king to d2 is also not very good, because bishop c4... Rook e7, king a4, king c3, bishop e6, rook c7, say b5. And, okay, black is a little bit better here. The pawns are more than enough compensation for the rook. Um, or I should say the exchange. So it's, I think, better for white to play king e3 and just go active on the king side rather than to sit on the queen side. And, okay, I mean, I think this is about equal. Um, White has enough activity and um, the potential of counterplay on, on the king side with rook f4 or king f4, e5, f6, and so on. But it's, it's, it's tense. So this, is, this exchange sack isn't bad, uh, but maybe I would have tried to find some way to make progress without, without that. But it wasn't bad. Of course, it worked perfectly, and the winner is always right. Okay, well, let's go on to the next one. And this is between Hare Krishnan, who had white, and um, Michael Bugatti. And so White, who submitted the game, was uh, 1812. Black was 1701. And says this is a game which, though he won, he had problems finding um, good plans in the middle game. And, um, okay, there were some interesting tactics back and forth, but he was able to win with some counter sacks. Uh, let me start from, from here. So the game was fairly even up to this point, and at least at a glance, it seemed reasonably played. But here, White made a mistake. So he's in check here, and um, didn't want to exchange off the second bishop. You know, it's it's, it's kind of scary to have a, a light squared bishop um, right in front of you in this kind of a position here. So this this is of course a little bit unpleasant looking, but as it's kind of hard for the black queen to get to a square where it can even threaten queen of g2 mate. I should say, safely gets to such a square. Uh, this is actually playable for, for white. Uh, one thing that he could also play is maybe knight e2, knight f4 to, to try to kick it out. But generally speaking, he's okay. Both sides have their chances, let's put it that way. Well, in the game, white played king to f1. And at a glance, this looks reasonable, but black found a pretty convincing refutation. You might want to see if you can find it too. Well, the move that black found was queen takes d4. Very, very nice. The point is on e takes d4, bishop to d3 check. The white king is stuck. All he can do is play knight e2, but this costs him gobs of material. So takes, 
discovered check, and then he takes the queen, and he's going to be up a piece and a pawn with lots of threats. Um, okay, he'll lose the knight on h3, but he'll take the exchange on d1. So absolutely winning for black. So white rightly uh, played knight to e2, didn't fold up his tent, but resisted. And now um, black missed a nice way to, I think, finish the game. So he played queen to d8, but it's too bad. Uh, that he forgot his own idea. He should have played bishop to d3. Now knight takes d4 is impossible. If e takes d4, it just transposes into the last variation. Bishop takes e2 check, followed by bishop to b5 check. And if bishop takes h3, black gets to land another spectacular blow with rook takes e3. f e3, queen e3, and white's just dead lost. The threat is queen e2 mate, but it's also queen f2 mate. And uh, there's no good answer to these double threats. So this would have been a very nice way for Black to, to finish the game. And he could show all of his friends and brag about it for, for months and years to come. However, uh, he not only failed to find this, but he even went on to lose the game. So, so much for uh, bragging rights. So it is a pity for him, though. He, queen takes d4 was very nice. Anyway, queen of d8, knight c4. And now white starts to, uh, to gain some ground. Knight to d6. Okay, black is up a pawn, better position. Should play something like bishop to e6 or bishop to g4. But okay, he goes to d7. And he's you know has this kind of bluff of playing c5 at some point. But generally speaking, you don't want to put your pieces on passive squares. Uh, another drawback to this move is that it makes it harder for him to kick out this knight from d6, which he could do with rook to d8 or rook to d7 at some later moment. So this, you now rook a to c1. Another mistake. Uh, this walks into a tactical problem. So do you see this one? How does black exploit rook a to c1? The answer, of course, is knight takes f2. So a typical trick against this kind of f2, e3 pawn structure when you've got a knight on g4 or h3 or even on e4. So king f2, bishop e3, king f1, takes, takes, let's say rook to d8. And black should be winning here. So he's got a rook and three pawns for two knights. And white's king is a bit exposed. And the knight on d6 may be overextended. So this, this should be a win for black. So fortunately for white, he got bailed out a second time. Black played knight to g5, voluntarily retreating. Okay, queen c2, probably another inaccuracy. Black should play bishop to g4 with a clear advantage. But black played a6. Okay, again, bishop to g4 should be played. Black played the strange queen of d8, kind of walking into a new pin here. Uh, his idea, I think, is he wants to play bishop to c7, but um, you know, it would have just been much simpler to get rid of the knight by putting a rook on d8 moves ago and clearing the bishop away from d7. Okay, well, white plays knight f5, and they repeat. And then the second time, white finds an interesting way to go. He plays knight takes g7. And this is quite nice, and it works perfectly. So king g7, h4. And here black had to return the piece with rook e5, takes and takes. And black's up a pawn, but his pawn structure is pretty bad, and white's pretty active, so white would be a little bit better here. In the game, black was uh, didn't suspect what was happening and played knight to e6. Let's see if you can figure out what's wrong with this one. What has black done wrong here? Well, the answer is a nice, simple, but nice combination. Knight h5 check, king h8, and the same would actually happen on king h6. Um, rook takes d7, queen d7. Well, oh, he didn't play queen e7. If he does, then knight f6 threatens the queen. The queen moves queen h7 as mate, and that would be true if the black king were on h6 as well. It'd be the exact same thing. Well, it would be the exact same thing, except that the king is on h6. So that wouldn't have made any difference with respect to this combination. So black tried queen to c8. This doesn't help. Rook f7. Queen takes h7. Mate is threatened once again. Knight f8. Knight f6. And again, uh, the threat is made on h7. So just taking twice there, or taking on f8, and then taking on h7. So black would have to um, give up the queen with queen to c7 to avoid that mate. And that's hopeless. So he gave up here. So a bit of a lucky win. Well, yes and no. <laughs> Somewhat of a lucky win for, for White. Lucky in that his opponent missed um, many good moves, and including a, a clear forced win. 
but also not lucky. I mean, he put up the best resistance he could, and he was lured to his chances. So sometimes that's what it takes to win a game. Uh, you guys saw my game from a few weeks ago where I was just completely lost and held on and held on and held on and even managed to win on time. So, you know, resourceful defense is always important. But at the same time, you have to bear in mind that uh, your opponent does have to give you help. So it's um, a little bit of luck in that respect, too. Okay, next game. So this is uh, between Simon Dixon and Raghav Ramesh. And I hope I'm not butchering his name. So Ramesh is the one who submitted this and um, said that after the opening... Okay, he says, um, I was black in this game and really struggled with the fact that we seemed to go straight into the end game after the opening. I couldn't come up with a reasonable plan. Where did I go wrong? Okay, well, let's just jump to that uh, opening end game, as it were. And, um, okay, let me flip the board here. So I would say that black is completely equal at this point. But also, we shouldn't take it too much as an endgame at this point. Because while queens are off, that's about the only sense in which it's an endgame. So it's, you know, we're only on move seven here for white. And, um, you know, there are a lot of pieces. All kinds of plans are still possible. The kings could theoretically get in danger at some point. I mean, there's still enough pieces that you can't just put your king in the middle of the board with uh, no attention to, to consequences. So whatever we want to classify it as, it's um, not a pure ending, for sure. Okay, white played knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, knight b6, bishop to b5. And here I think um, black loses the thread a little bit. So here's what happens over the next few moves. Okay, bishop d7, white castled, e6. Both sides just keep developing. And already here I think white's a bit better. And now I think his advantage is getting more significant. Okay, it's not a not a big advantage yet, but it's, it's on the way there. And I, I would say that black has already gone a bit wrong here. Well, what did he do wrong? What should he have done instead? So let's go back here, and let's make a few more moves, and we'll start here where I think black starts to, to go astray. Okay, so first of all, he plays bishop to d7, and this isn't a bad move, all right, um, but it's not really clear to me that bishop takes e6 as any threat. Now, maybe knight to e5 you might view as a minor threat, so we'll figure out what to do about that. And Maybe bishop to d7 is the right move, but let's think about what black is trying to achieve here. What should black do? Well... One way of trying to figure out your plan, what the right plan is, or what a right plan is, there's not necessarily just one right plan in a position, uh, is to figure out what your strengths are in the position. What, what does black have going for him that white doesn't have uh, going for him in response? And the answer, and really the only answer at this point, is that black has this kingside majority. So he's got four pawns over on the side of the board to three for white. Of course, white has a queenside majority. To only two pawns over here for black. Um, three pawns to two for black. So what black wants to do is to take advantage of his kingside majority. How will we do that? Well, you got to push where you've got the extra. So for this reason, uh, f6 and e5 is, I think, a very logical way to proceed. And f6, not coincidentally, also stops knight to e5. So I think this is the way to go. f6 followed by e5. There's no real threat involved with bishop takes c6. Then black gets the bishop pair. And um, so if this exchange happens, these pawns on the queen side are actually even better equipped now to deal with white's queen side majority because it's that much harder for him to create a passer. Black gets the bishop pair. Um, among other ideas, you might play a5 and bishop to a6. So something like e5, put a rook on d8 have a very nice control over the d3 square, and this could be even better for black. So I think this is the way to go. All right, so bishop d7, castles. Again, I think f6 followed by e5 is the way to go. Uh, a6 may not even be bad, just to flick that in to break this little diagonal tension. All right, so e6 here, 95, or 94. Okay, so what's the knight doing on e4? It's not going to go over to the king side and attack anything, so clearly black has to worry about this knight jumping in to c5 or to d6. All right, well, once again, let's think, um, well, not about our plan this time, but let's think about white's plan. So we know what he wants to do. Let's see if we can prevent it. 
So one idea might be a6, again driving the bishop off of this diagonal, and now f5, and now e5. And lo and behold, we've managed to take care of all of our ideas. So we've prevented uh, white from achieving what he wanted, we've driven him back, and we've managed to expand with our, our majority on the, uh, the king side or the center, however you want to think about it. And these two pawns here are very strong, so they're covering all these squares on the fourth rank, and that keeps white's pieces pretty well dominated. So all of white's minor pieces, well, three of them anyway, are really kind of bottled up here, in good part, in large part, thanks to black's pawns. So I think black is at least equal here, maybe even slightly better. Okay, so instead of a6 and then f5, black castled. Here white should probably play rook to d1, just to uh, start threatening things, or at least threaten to threaten things, and to have knight d6 ready on tap. So after bishop to e3, maybe knight e5 is, is a good move and will um, interfere with white's plans. But okay, knight e5, bishop c5, and now, yeah, black is uh, a bit worse. So white has managed to gain control over these, uh, these squares in the center and these dark, dark squares in particular. Black hasn't done anything to make his majority meaningful at all. And um, okay, so white has an edge. So the game goes on from here, but, but I think uh, we can just leave it at that with, with this, the discussion of how to handle this kind of position. And the thing that's very important is that this, this minority attack, or not minority attack, this queenside ma majority um, set up for white is very common to a lot of openings. Um, the French, where black plays d takes e4, will often come to a pawn structure like this. Various Karakans will. Um, various Queen's Gambit and Slavs. Well, no, sorry, not, um, no, no, that, that's not right. Well, no, it is right, but with colors reversed. So you can have that kind of structure with opposite colors uh, as well. So there are a lot of openings where you get this, where one side has the four on three with the extra e pawn against the other side's three on two with the extra c pawn. And if you've got the four on three, what you want to try to do is to push these pawns, if you can do so safely, and, um, and grab central space. And in the middle game especially, that can give the side with the four on three advantage the better prospects. All right, so enough of that one. On to a game between Lettington and Hollands. So this was submitted by Black, uh, White's 1626 player, Black's 1570, and uh, Black was quite proud of this game, and I, and I think it was a, a very good game, especially for, for his rating. So some, some inaccuracies later in the game, though, but um, overall, not bad. All right, so let's take a quick look. So it looks like a dragon, but it turns into the the newfangled hybrid, although even Bofinick played this uh, many, many decades ago, half a century ago. So it's not completely newfangled, but it's it's had a, a kind of a new lease on, lease on life in the last five years or so. Okay, so bishop b3, bishop g7 here. And yeah, white wasn't able to find a very compelling way to fight against this. And generally speaking, Okay, it's not a universal rule, certainly, but very often, if white plays f3 and a3 in an open Sicilian, it's generally an admission of failure. So he's really worried about the e-pawn and the b4 advance, and um, is more or less trying to, to maintain what he's got, rather than looking for ways of improving his position. And so from here, black's life is very, very easy. Okay, so rook c8 is good. Knight f4. And here I think black should just castle. Uh, black made it quite a while to castle, and, and needlessly so, I think. There isn't any real danger of um, white setting up some kind of kingside hack attack, uh, in part because if he tries to castle queenside, I mean, he's going to get murdered much faster than anything he could hope to do to black. And also, just as a general rule, okay, so it's giving the f7 pawn more protection, which is relevant as long as this bishop is, is sitting on b3 with, with evil designs. And, um, you know, also you get this rook into play, and just a good idea. Okay, but black played knight to b6, and this looks logical at first glance. You'd like to drop this knight on c4, but white has a, a nice tactic, which would really serve as kind of a refutation, e5. And the point is that, okay, the knight has to move because on the otherwise desirable d takes e5, Queen d8, rook d8, bishop to b6 is just winning material, winning the exchange. 
So uh, 19b6 was inaccurate for that reason. But white missed it. Queen e2. Now castling is okay, but black played knight c4. Takes, takes, rook d1. Now black makes a good move. Okay, so white threatens to play e5 here, thanks to this pin. So black plays knight to d7, which is good for two reasons. So one is, of course, it stops that threat. Or I should say it's good for three reasons. It also starts to put some pressure directly on this knight here. And it prepares to swing the knight to another good square, like e5 or b6. Okay, so white castled, black castled, bishop to d2. And here, um, black, played, or black played knight to e5, but I think it's even better to play knight b6. I think black probably played knight to e5 in, out of a kind of inertia. So the past couple of moves, um, knight to b6 would have maybe allowed e5, or at least he was perhaps afraid that there would be e5 ghosts uh, floating around. But now that the bishop is on d2 especially, there, there's just not even... Not even a ghost of e5 anymore. Maybe the, the ghost of a ghost. So, okay, why am I making a big deal? Well, knight to b6 does a couple of things that are that are very good that knight e5 doesn't do. So it, it doesn't block the bishop on g7. That's first. Uh, secondly, it keeps an eye on d5. So if, if white were to play knight to d5, then um, black can just keep taking there. So, um, knight to e5. King h1, rook c8, good move, clearing c4 for the knight. And here, black is just much, much better. Clear advantage, easily. Rook to b1. Okay, now here, try to figure out what black's best move is here. I mean, black has a terrific position, but what's best? Well, in the game, black made a, a simple tactical shot, which isn't bad, but I think he missed something better. So he played knight takes a3 b a3, bishop c3. Um, and this isn't bad, although I think after a4, had white played that, then, okay, it's not that black would have regretted this so much, but that uh, further exchanges take place, and uh, white's disadvantages at least relatively lessened. But there's no question. I mean, black is clearly better regardless. But the best move here is knight takes d2, queen d2, and then the soft move queen to c7. But it's not that soft, because the knight can't move without hanging the c2 pawn. On the other hand, if um, you know, it doesn't move, then, then black will make the, the exchange all the same. And it will be similar to what we had before, but I think in an even better version, because now black has very fast and very strong counterplay on the c file. Well, I mean, he does in the other case too, but... I think this this works out just a little bit better for black. Okay, well, in the game, knight a3 takes takes. Okay, and here again, a4 would have been the best. And then after bishop d2, queen d2, the c2 pawn is reasonably well protected. Okay, so this was a little bit of a favor to black here, this exchange. And now black should have played queen c8. So piling up in a way that he couldn't have done um, had white not played bishop takes c3. But black played queen d7, takes, takes, rook f to d1. And <laughs> white is encouraging black to uh, to do the right thing and put his queen on the c file. On the other hand, he does, does get a little something. So knight b4, queen c4, queen f2. Okay, so the knight's not badly placed on b4. The c pawn is guarded well enough for the moment. Now, what should black do here? So again, take a moment, try to figure this out. Well, one good rule of thumb is that when you're up in material, uh, of course you should always look for ways to improve your position, to to make good things happen, uh, to, to execute your plans. But you should also pay especially careful uh, attention to what your opponent might do. So if you're up a pawn, the thing to realize is that you now have two ways to win the game. You can win the game, let's say, on the board, as it were, but you can also win by swapping off and reaching a standard kind of theoretically one ending. So given that you always have that uh, option, it's okay to, to trade and to neutralize your opponent's plans more than maybe you would try to um, under circumstances where the material is even. So what I'm getting at is that I think black should just play queen to c5. 
and not let white's queen go rooting around on squares like like b6 and a7 where it might really mess up uh, black's coordination and then he has to worry about defending the b7 uh, the b5 pawn and the e7 pawn and things like this so rook a8 i think is inaccurate for that reason so queen to b6 bishop c6 and now i think if white plays queen to c7 black is getting kind of clumsy here i mean i think white has real real counterplay now so again, e7 is weak. If he pushes that pawn, then the d6 pawn falls. And um, yeah, I mean, it just doesn't really coordinate all that well in this position. But fortunately for black, white played knight c6 and went on to win um, the end game. There were some, still some errors uh, later on in the game, but more or less the trend was always in black's favor and, um, and he won. So a very nice opening and uh, early middle game, especially by, by Black, played very well. And I think it shows the, uh, the power, especially at a club level, but even, even above that, really, of the, uh, the Dragodorf. So this is, this is a, a neat opening to play. I think it's reasonably sound, at least, in its own right, and maybe completely sound, but at least reasonably sound. But there's the further advantage that most people just don't really know anything about it. So it's, it's quite a practical choice as well. Okay. On to the next game. So this was submitted by White, who was, I don't know, Sit Vono, X-I-T-V-O-N-O. And uh, the game ends up a draw. Uh, he's a B player. And he decided to post this one because it includes a queen ending, which he's learning, interested in learning more about. Uh, and he also wants to know if the bishop to d3 move, we'll see what that is in the opening of sound, and what White should do after queen takes d4 to take advantage of his development, uh, advantage of his superior development. So let's take a look at this. So the main move here, as most of you know, is knight to g3. And there's tons and tons and tons of theory on this. Tens of thousands of games have occurred in that variation. Uh, not a bad line as a sideline is knight to c5, which is either a Bronstein invention or, or at least something that he, he popularized. But our, uh, our reader asks, what about bishop to d3, which is the move he played? And, okay, I'm inclined to think... Um, that there really isn't anything you can do to take advantage of your superior development after queen takes d4, knight f3, because if there were, then no, everyone would play bishop to d3, um, and that's not the case. But I think this line is playable, so let's let's give a quick tour of the options here. Okay, uh, one option for black, if you want to be a very safety first kind of player, is just to swap. So just takes, takes, knight f6, Bishop f3, and then, okay, either e6 immediately or knight b to d7 first, followed by e6. So here's a sample variation. And this kind of approach for black is called a, a Fort Knox. So you, you swap off the light squared bishop, you then set up pawns on c6 and e6 in this kind of structure where white's given up his e-pawn for black's d-pawn. And it's very, very difficult for white to breach this without massive exchanges. Because, you know, how's he going to do it? I mean, really the only way to, to kind of break into Black's position is to play d5 at some point. But you can see that that's going to entail at least three exchanges. And, um, you know, you can have this very symmetrical kind of position at the end of all of it. So White has the slightly better chances and that he's got a little bit more space and more, well... The burden is on black to make sure that if the position opens up, it's not to the advantage of white and his bishops. So for that reason, maybe white has a very, very small kind of edge in this kind of situation, generally speaking. But really, I think this is pretty close to equal, and it's very, very solid. And black can look for c5 and e5 breaks on his own, uh, of his own at some point, too. So this, I think, is pretty good for black. One sound way to go. Uh, another is just to grab the pawn. So let's take a look at this. Knight f3, queen d8, queen e2. Uh, the reason for this is that black would like to play bishop e4 and then queen takes d1. So white doesn't want to have a queen swap when he's down a pawn, so queen e2. And now knight f6. And this, this is a perfectly good idea. Now you might think, well, gee, doesn't this lose a piece? And the answer is no. And this is a very typical trick in the caro can. Knight f6, g f6, bishop f5, and there's queen a5 check followed by queen takes f5. And it doesn't seem to me that black's compensation, or sorry, that white's compensation 
suffices for Black's extra pawn. Uh, this is a line given by Jovanka Huska in her book on the Karo Can. Maybe it's been played before too, but uh, anyway, it's a typical idea for Black. Uh, possible improvement though, I think maybe White can just castle and allow this doubled exchange and even queen to d5. Because I think after queen to b4, the position is a little bit unclear. Um, black's best is probably c5. White plays queen to b5 check, knight to d7. And I think black has some, some counterplay. Uh, sorry, white has counterplay. Not sure why I'm getting uh, these colors confused when I'm speaking here. But anyway, uh, white has counterplay for the pawn. Um, and that's understandable. I mean, black's king is not really very close to castling. Except maybe queenside, but that would be pretty pretty risky. While well, white is already castled, uh, he just has to move his bishop out of the way, and then his rooks can come to the central files. So this, I think, is not so bad. Um, I don't know that white's better. I, I definitely couldn't go that far, but it's um, it is I think full compensation. So maybe instead of this, another idea. Okay, so we looked at bishop b4. We looked at queen takes d4. Uh, another idea of Huska's I think is pretty good. So knight to d7, and on knight g to f3, knight g to f6, or sorry, just knight f3, knight g to f6, takes, takes, and again on bishop f5, there's queen a5 followed by queen takes f5, and black is fine. And, and this I think is completely right. I think white has really no chances for an advantage here. No, no real chances. So the computer might say for a moment that white is plus 0.2 or something like that, but uh, really, this kind of structure is just very, very safe for black. No no serious worries at all. Okay, so basically the reason why is that it's a Fort Knox, more or less, but with white not even having the bishop here any longer. So there, this is uh, very, very solid and, and I think doesn't doesn't give white anything even resembling the, uh, the kinds of chances he gets in the main line with knight to g3. Okay, well, the other question was about the queen ending, and it was a long queen ending with um, many things that could be discussed and you know some improvements that could be noted. So all I want to say about it, and this is these are I think good rules of thumb about queen endings for anyone, and um, and certainly can be utilized in in looking at this game. So I'm just going to give three big rules of thumb about queen endings. So first of all, centralization of the queen is very very important. Um, this, this I think, can't be uh, overestimated. So it's it's worth worth bearing that in mind. When you can centralize the queen, do so. Secondly, the quality of the pawns count for more than their quantity, and really that's referring to past pawns. So past pawns are especially important, and how far along they are. So the further the past pawns are advanced, the more important uh, they are, and and that outweighs much of the time the number of pawns that one side or the other has. And then a third point is that one shouldn't confuse a lot of checks with perpetual check in a queen ending. So sometimes people will play, when they're on the strong side, they'll play too passively with their king because they're afraid, okay, if my king comes out, I'm going to get I'm going to get checked, you know, dozens of times and I'll just never get out of it or just a whole bunch of checks. Well, there are perpetual checks in queen endings, that's true, but they're far from guaranteed because there are at least three kinds of ways of getting out of, or at least three resources, I should say, that um, you have when you're trying to avoid a perpetual check. So one, of course, is your own pawns. Secondly, your opponent's pawns. You should not underestimate this. Uh, often your opponent's pawns can be a very useful place to, to kind of hide out for the king. Those of you who have been around for a while and remember the uh, the famous Kaspara versus the rest of the world game that was played on um, the MSN network back in the late 90s, um, you might remember that there were a lot of variations where uh, Kasparov wouldn't take uh, the world team's pawns precisely for that reason. He needed to hide behind them to avoid perpetual checks. Um, and then the third thing, the third resource that the, uh, the the wandering king has to avoid perpetual checks is the idea of a cross check. So in other words, some position where if your opponent puts you in check, you interpose with your queen and put the, the opponent's queen in check, uh, sorry, put the opponent's king in check, and force a queen trade. Of course, in such a circumstance, it has to be your past pawns that are further advanced. So, with those resources in mind, um, you know, of course, you need to evaluate them, but but they give you um, something to, to use to keep in mind. And 
bearing those in mind, you don't need to keep your king passive. So that's really the point. Um, you don't have to win or try to win the game by leaving your king, let's say, behind a kingside fiend cattle or something like that and just never use it. So the king can be used as an active piece, and um, you just got to use the tools that are that are available in the game. Okay, so we're not going to look at the actual queen ending, but I uh, give those bits of advice and um, invite him to uh, certainly look for himself and to try to use those. Okay, uh, this is a game between opponent, once again, and Van de Witz. Um, again, not sure I'm saying his name correctly, uh, Cashelton Van de Witz. So about this game, he wanted to know about the rook versus minor piece ending that he got into and um, felt that he should have done better in this ending and um, you know, essentially wanted to know why he, uh, why he went downhill. And so let's start from here. And really, I think, okay, so he's black in this position, so we can flip the board here. And if it were black to move, I think black would be okay. He could play king f7, and then king e7, and keep the bad guys out, or really the bad guy. The king is already more or less locked out. We just need to keep the rook out of the game. But I, I think he's just too late. So it seems to me that white is just winning here because he breaks in by force. So rook to d1, and there's no way to cover all the entry points. He plays knight to c6. And now if white just plays rook to d7, there's no really adequate defense to the threat of rook c7 and then rook to c8. It just seems to win. So, you know, the thing is, okay, minor pieces are better than a rook, all things being equal, but they're not equal here. So, first of all, uh, white also not only has this instant access with his rook, but black has nothing to do with his minor pieces. I mean, the bishop on a8... It's okay. It's better than a pawn, but it's not a lot better than a pawn at this point. The uh, the knight is okay, but you know it, it has to to get to b4 before it's even really achieving anything. Um, and also, white has a queenside majority. While black's kingside majority is pretty useless because of the doubled f pawns, he can't use them. So white also, uh, in addition to the the mayhem he can cause with his rook right away, has at his disposal plans involving a3, b4 and pushing these pawns. So white's just winning here. Okay, fortunately for, for uh, black, though, white made some mistakes. So here, instead of rook to d7, white played rook to d5. Understandable, but uh, this, this gives black some time to scrape up a defense. So king f7, rook c5, king e6. And now, okay, white's rook, he grabbed the pawn, but now the rook is, it, it stopped, it stymied. It, it can't get in, it can't do anything. So he played rook to b5. But there's no further penetration points on the uh, on, on the B file. So simply king to d6. White realized, okay, yeah, I'm not getting getting anywhere this way. So rook to d5 check. King e6, he repeated. Uh, probably black should play king c7. There's nothing for the white rook to do on the king side. It can't get there. Um, so I think the black king should stay on the queen side to help out in the fight against the passed pawns. And then he can activate his bishop as well. So he can play bishop uh, b7, c8, e6, and um, and even chase the uh, the rook back. So I think this would have been black's best chance, and then he's not even in that bad of shape. So king e6, okay, this is all right. Black played rook to d2, which strikes me as, frankly, just a bit weird. Uh, I, I see no no good reason to, to retreat at all. So something like, something like a3, and then bringing the king over the queen side, let's say d2 and then via d2 to c3 and then pushing the pawns looks like a perfectly good winning strategy to me. So after rook to d2, okay, king e7 was a good move, a3, and now a move that black should have played and couldn't have played if the rook were still on d5 is knight to a5. And now the position is actually equal. All of a sudden, white has found, you know, from having utter domination and all the activity, now what does he do? I mean, if he plays b4, knight takes c4, and then the a-pawn is threatened too. So, you know, what's white going to play? Rook to b2, but then he's completely passive. So white has managed to absolutely botch this at this point. Fortunately uh, for him, black missed his chance and played a5. Very natural move, but knight a5 was, was just very, very strong. Now white comes up with a good plan, and against this, uh, black really has no defense. 
at least if white did it right. So king e2. Actually, c5 is pretty good uh, to play back, to play rook to d6 again and, and tie uh, black down. But okay, king e2. So everything has been done beautifully. Okay, g3, good move. h5. And now the obvious moves. Okay, you could play h4. This doesn't hurt anything. Or b4. Okay, this is perfectly fine. So either of these moves maintains a winning position. Now, the thing is, okay, when you've got pass pawns, when you have two connected pass pawns, you want to advance them in such a way that as quickly as possible they can go side by side, they can stay side by side. So what I mean is that, okay, first of all here, okay, let's say AB, whoops, sorry, missed, AB, AB. Black wants to arrange it so that, sorry, white wants to arrange it so that whichever pawn he pushes first, he can push the other one really quickly. So if he plays b5, he must be able to play c5 quickly. If he plays c5 first, he must be able to play b5 next. Well, and which one do you want to push first? Well, you want to push whichever one makes it more difficult for the opponent to blockade. So here, it would be b5, because if you play c5, get rid of that. If you play c5, then black can play knight to a7, knight to b5, and the b pawn's not moving. If you play b5 first, however, then how is black going to prevent c5? I mean, he can play knight to a7 and stop it for a move, but after king to b4, then there's no way to stop c5. Well, no good way. You could play bishop takes c4, but nothing that uh, is particularly intelligent. So this would be the right way to go, and this is the general rule of how to handle uh, and how to utilize two connected pass pawns. You want to push them in such a way that they don't get blockaded. So what does white do? He plays c5. Big mistake. Why? Well, knight a7. So after knight a7, the pawns are blockaded. So if a4, to stop knight to b5, then knight c6, again we've got a blockade. And if b4, then knight to b5 check. And black can just sit here, and it's very difficult for white to make progress. So this uh, would have really taken advantage of white's uh, very, very sloppy play. So unfortunately, though, black played h4, and um, okay, from here, white finished a little bit more uh, cleanly. Though actually here, he just played b4 again, but still takes, takes knight a7. So white played gh, gf, and this is, a, I think, a mistake from black, because now the h-pawn is a problem, too. Uh, here, rook to b6 would be best, but okay. I mean, white has done many things wrong. But at the end of the day, he still has too many passed pawns, and, and black is lost. So there we go. He's queening. All right. So we, we saw some things there. I mean, um, rook activity was obviously very important because white had it, you know, basically in spades at the beginning. He was winning. Um, once he gave it up, it was less clear. Um, but then it was the past pawns, and then the question is about blockading. So hopefully some good rules of thumb here that you can use in your games um, will help. Okay, on to the next game. Okay, yeah, so this is from uh, Graham Cridland against Arthur Liu, and um, Cridland is the one who submitted it. And, um, okay, he actually annotated it in quite a bit of depth himself, so I don't really uh, feel too much of a need to uh, to rehash all the things that he said. You can find it for yourself in the um, in the thread, the uh, ask um, or you know show show me your games thread. But I did want to start from here and um, say something about this. So I think in this position he said that he thought for a long time, used most of the rest of his time, couldn't figure out a way to win, and then played like this. So okay, it's black to move here, uh, king g7, king e4, king g8, f5. Takes, takes, king g7, rook d8. Okay, black played d5. And here, it was just a draw agreed. And indeed, this position is a draw. So it, it may seem surprising to you that with a full extra exchange and, and pawns on the board, that white isn't winning, but he's not. So it's um, the, the key thing, the key aspect here is that this bishop is great on this diagonal. It's a very good defensive diagonal. 
The only way for white to win would be to play rook to d7 and g6. Okay, well, the problem is, all right, let me, um, let's say we, let's set that up here. Okay, so king f5, let's say bishop to c3, rook d7. Well, black can simply play king f8. And with this bishop on the diagonal, king f6, which would otherwise be winning, is um, illegal. So that's the main reason why this is a draw, and why the bishop is great um, if you post it that way, because then this rook d7, g6 threat is completely neutralized. All right. And in fact, going back to the beginning, after king g7, king e4, king g8, f5, once f5 happens, it's just a draw. So there's there's no no winning chances to be had here. Black just jettisons the pawn, puts the bishop on that long diagonal, and it's and it's easy from there. So the better try would have been king to d5. So we want to keep the second pawn on the board. And this at least requires more accuracy from black. I believe it's still a draw, but it's trickier. So king g7. Let's make some kind of waiting moves here. But essentially, the, the, the same plan is in effect. I mean, white wants to put his rook... Uh, sorry, actually, not the same plan. Um, one part of the plan is the same. White does want to put his rook on the 7th rank, but he wants to get his king over to e8. And that's how he's going to try to win. So we'll see what it looks like if black plays it too passively, but we'll also see how black can hold it. And you might, as an exercise, want to try to figure it out for yourself. How should black defend this? Okay, king g8, king c6, king g7, rook c8, preparing king d7, king e8. So here, okay, we can play rook to d8 even. Um, so we can keep an eye on the d5 pawn, not let it go running too far. And now, okay, two possibilities for black. Let's start with just waiting. King g7, king to d7. And now, again, two possibilities for black. You can either play king g8 or d5. All right, if d5, king e8, d4, takes, bishop c5 or anywhere else, rook to d7, game over. So this, this isn't difficult after white wins the f-pawn. All right, so let's try waiting here with king to g8. Okay, then king e8, d5, takes. Well, again, the same thing. And the key thing here is that after f5, white has two ways of winning in this position. So one is just to play rook to d6, because on king h7, king f7, the g-pawn falls. But, and this is also very important to realize, rook takes g7 is uh, a forced win. Very simple. So king g7, king e7. And white is able to, to crowbar the black king away from the g-pawn. And by the way, even if there weren't any f-pawns, this would be a win. Because the king is in front of the pawn on the 6th rank, and so he wins like that. So the f-pawns aren't even necessary. Okay, so back to this position here. We saw that if black just sits and waits, he loses. But if he plays d5 here, then he draws. So the key idea is once again to stick the bishop onto a good diagonal, and, um, and then he can hold. Okay, so rook d3 here, okay, and black's bishop is going to keep bothering the f-pawn, and there's really nothing that white can do about that. So now he's got the pawn protected, but if the king has to stay there and babysit it, uh, he can't win. And that's basically the problem. I mean, one piece or the other, either the king or the rook has to stay guarding the f-pawn, and um, as long as it's doing that, then there won't be any real threats against the pawn on f7. So black is drawing. Uh, by the way, I guess I should mention this in case someone doesn't know, but um, in case you don't, rook versus bishop with nothing else on the board is a draw in almost every case. I mean, there are a few special cases where it's not, but if you have, let's say, what we can call an, a normal position, so in other words, one where um, there's no really immediate concrete threat or concrete winning procedure, um, generally a very simple one in this case, it's going to be a draw. So, you know, if you put the king, let's say, anywhere off the back rank and the bishop isn't um, dropping right away, then that's going to be uh, a draw. All right, so that's it for our big batch of games this week. Um, next time, we may look at the um, asking me a question uh, thread. If not, 
if there aren't enough um, new things there, and I think there probably are, but if there aren't, then we'll um, I'll present something else. Okay, so thanks a lot. And uh, finally, a reminder, check out my blog. It won't be there for long at this address, so take a look now, and um, that way you'll see where it goes to, because um, I should have the new location up in the next couple of days, I hope. So chessmind.powerblogs.com, chessmind.powerblogs.com. Thanks a lot. See you next time. Bye-bye.